we'll definitely it. take a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are we live? Okay, amazing. Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in to Power Hour uh, this lunchtime. I'm super excited because I'm sitting in the Hope on Hopkins distillery with Lucy, uh, one of the founders and distiller here at the distillery. Um, and before we get started on the gin and tonics, we're going to have a quick <laughs> chat and um, Lucy's agreed to share some of her learnings and stories and essentially some, I guess, advice to the budding entrepreneurs who are tuning into this on kind of how to get started and, and particularly in this kind of difficult and, and competitive industry. So very happy to have you on today. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe to start with, just tell us a little bit about yourself and, and about Hope on Hopkins. Absolutely. So yeah, I'm Lucy and I'm in business with my husband, Lee. And we set up the distillery sort of the end of 2013, beginning of 2014. Um, got the building mid 2014, and it's kind of been a bit of a roller coaster from there on out. <laughs> but we neither of us really come from the spirits industry at all, save that Lee uh, likes used to drinking own, yeah, likes <laughs> drinking and used to own a pub, a very well known okay. student pub, the Rat and Parrot, which is in Grahamstown in the Eastern Cape. Um, and that's where we met. So you kind of we have our roots in alcohol, as <laughs> we could say. But then we became lawyers and worked in corporate world, actually in the UK. We travelled, left South Africa, ended up in London, and stayed there. Um, converted our law degrees and worked as lawyers in very busy, kind of crazy corporate London life, which was amazing. Um, and I think sort of five years ago, if you'd said to us, we'd be back in Cape Town making gin, I don't think either of us would have believed you, but here we are. <laughs> Amazing. Well, yeah, this is, a, this is probably a far cry from corporate law. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, something that we talk about a bit and, and some of the community has been sending in questions recently in particular is around finding your why and finding almost your purpose and then building a business around that. So can you maybe speak a bit about taking the leap from corporate law into gin and I guess finding your why, if, if this is it. <laughs> um, yeah, if this is, I think that's the <laughs> eternal question. Yeah. So we actually sort of got here on a bit of a roundabout route. Um, the weather in London started getting us down. It rains there a lot and winters can be cold and dark. Um, and summer sometimes not much better. And after one bad summer too many, we were like, enough, let's go and follow the sun. And so I negotiated a sabbatical, Lee resigned his job, and we took what we thought was just going to be a year out. Um, <laughs> traveling around, we started in Morocco, and it was mainly around Southern Europe, basically literally following the sun. Amazing. And the minute you make that step out of corporate life, you suddenly realize that there's a whole other world out there. <laughs> We'd loved corporate life, and it was fantastic, and I certainly don't regret any of it. But you suddenly your eyes open you like you can actually survive without the monthly salary and <laughs> without yeah having to take on the stress for everybody else in the world Absolutely. Um, and so uh, probably about six weeks into our trip we were like right we're not gonna go back to our jobs what can we do <laughs> this is much more fun <laughs> <laughs> and we just wound our pace of life down completely you end up realizing you know yeah that there are other things out there and we knew we wanted to do something together. Yeah. Um, we didn't know what it was that we wanted to do. We love food and we love drink, but we aren't good enough to be chefs. Um, and so we actually started thinking, well, after kind of falling in love with a campsite in Morocco and then one in Portugal and thinking maybe we should buy them. <laughs> we were like, no, we don't have friends and family. We don't speak the languages of those countries. Yeah. Why don't we come home? Um, and we decided we wanted to do something in the drink space. And we actually thought wine first, yeah. not making wine, but doing a drinking wine, wine bar. <laughs> drinking wine, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> drinking is far much more fun than making. Um, and so I thought about opening a wine bar, um, but we got here too late. A wine bar just opened in Cape Town. And so we actually flew home in the August of 2013, which was our year out, okay. to look at the Cape Town scene and Amazing. kind of figure out what we thought it was lacking. Yeah. Um, and certainly on our travels through Southern Europe, we had been drinking a lot of gin because gin <laughs> was booming and still is booming over yeah. there. Um, and when looking at the Cape Town scene, sort of seeing the interest in coffee and food, in wine and craft beer, we thought that gin was the next logical step. Yeah. 
And so it was then literally, uh, let's do a bit of research and see if it's something that we might like to do and can we do, and not being scientists. <laughs> um, and yeah, it was just, we downloaded a book on whiskey distilling actually, because there's not much out there on, on gin distilling. Okay. And um, realized it wasn't, you know, it wasn't too much of a challenge, we didn't think. Um, lots of other craft gin people had been accountants and marketing people and you know done all sorts of other things and okay. so we thought yeah Why it's something we could do <laughs> and awesome. so we jumped in with both feet <laughs> and look, look at what you've built now it's amazing we'll have to um we'll have to do a bit of a tour after our chat to show people what you've built it into because um yeah this, this place is amazing no, thank you um do you have any i guess any advice for people who are thinking about taking the leap and leaving corporate yeah um, sort of what we what struck us the most is on the financial side of things um, yes we've been working in corporate you know you kind of earning a salary you get a wage at the end of every month and all yeah. the perks that go with it we did our business plan you know having come from corporate and looked at lots of business plans yeah. and we were way <laughs> out um, we ended up spending a lot more well needing to spend a lot more than we anticipated and yeah. it also took a lot longer to set up just yeah. because of licensing and bureaucracy mainly and it always does um, I think yeah <laughs> indeed I'll never forget actually sort of after we made the decision we saw a program on restaurants and the stat that was quoted in that program was that something like 35% of restaurants never open their doors oh my gosh and at the time I was like that's ridiculous yeah. how can it be so hard <laughs> and when we were sort of floundering thinking our license was never going to come through I was like now I understand oh yeah. why people don't get to open their doors because it actually the challenges in opening and setting up are far bigger than we had ever anticipated yeah. but they're not insurmountable so <laughs> hang in there and, but yeah just always just I think my advice is to look at it realistically but then have a huge contingency yeah. in there, both timing-wise and financially. financially. Yeah, yeah, I think that's I think that's very sound advice. Because Hope and Hopkins was was it the first gin distillery in Cape Town, or one of the first? One of the first in Cape Town. Yeah. Okay. So I imagine some of the challenges you were facing were kind of fresh challenges, and now potentially it's, you paved the way. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, we have paved the way. <laughs> but it was, I mean, on the licensing side especially. Um, you have to not only get a liquor license, but you get licenses from SARS because you pay excise duty on production of alcohol. Yeah. And the Cape Town SARS team had never encountered a spirits warehouse before. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so they literally kind of, I think, kept on putting our application at the bottom of the pile so they didn't yeah. need to deal with it. Um, <laughs> you know, it was that kind of thing, yeah. yeah. But we got there in the end. And so, um, I mean, thinking about those early days, what were some of the, I guess big decisions that you had to make that you maybe could have gone one way or the other or you wish you had known to think about beforehand. Yeah, I think the challenge for us was because it was an industry so new to us. I'm just going to give this to you. Okay. It's, it's oh, getting it loud just, in here. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, 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 fine. It's, it's a running distillery. So. <laughs> I know that noise will kick on and off, I'm afraid. Um, I think our biggest challenge was, yeah, we didn't really know what we were doing. I don't think we still quite know what we're doing 100%, but we're learning. Um, and so we were in the position of having to order equipment without really knowing our requirements. Yeah. And of course we got advice and we spoke to other distillers um, and other craft distilleries and had you know experts in the area helping us yeah. um, procure equipment. but. Yeah, we would have definitely done things quite <laughs> differently. And we've actually recently acquired our new still, Mad Mary. Mad Mary. Um, and I think she is, yeah, what we had wanted from the beginning. But yeah, both our knowledge base and our finances didn't quite stretch to that okay. at the beginning. But um, I think you also learn, you know, yes, we would have done things differently. But the, the way we did it, we had to make some mistakes, and I think you learn from those mistakes. Absolutely. And don't be afraid of learning from mistakes. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, how it sounds like you had quite a good support structure in place, like of, of advisors or other people to help you along. Completely. It was quite amazing. And I think that coming home to Cape Town in particular, where there are a lot of entrepreneurs, we're surrounded by entrepreneurs, yeah. <laughs> people are incredibly supportive. And I think sort of coming from corporate, I was quite taken aback by that. Yeah. And people f were free with advice, were free with introductions. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were helped 
along the way, in particular by one other distiller here in South Africa, Roger Jorgensen. Okay, amazing. Um, and yeah, he was incredible to us. We went out and distilled with him. He came once we received our equipment and distilled with us. Oh, amazing. Um, and then the beer brewers, because we do two of our gins from grain. Um, and we found, we found fermentation very challenging initially. <laughs> I can um, <laughs> and we were helped an incredible amount by mostly craft brewers but but big brewers as well and no it's been that has just been incredible and we wouldn't be where we are now without that yeah. help That's you know really I, I i relate as well when i compare the almost entrepreneur ecosystem in cape town uh to sydney or or to london as well i also found everyone here is so willing and giving yeah. of their time and experience and as long as you ask for it, which I guess is kind of an internal hurdle that people need to get past, that you can get that support in place. No. And I sort of have also found now, you know, we're several years into our journey and people are starting to come to us and ask for advice. And so I'm always more than happy to bend over backwards for people because we were, you know, yeah. just given so much support and wouldn't have made it without that. Paying it forward. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's important. Yeah. And so are there, are there challenges operating in the alcohol industry specifically, I guess, other than getting the license up front? Are you still facing challenges? I think the challenge of the industry, and I mean, I still feel as I, it's sort of this huge industry I don't know very much about. Um, but one of the major challenges is that it's populated by huge players with very deep pockets. Okay. Um, and you're coming at it from a very different angle. Um, and so, especially starting out, you know, we didn't have money for anything kind of yeah. thing. <laughs> and, and we were needing to justify why people should be paying slightly more. It's yeah. because it costs us more to make it kind of thing, <laughs> actually, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was an interesting sort of trying to yeah become established and now luckily the gin scene here is 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 really you know sort of flying Absolutely. um and so it's become a lot easier but no especially initially just breaking into a market which has traditionally been populated by very big international players yeah. with lots of money <laughs> um, and lots of resources um but also luckily the craft beer guys had kind of paved the way a bit as well definitely something i've noticed um well, what, how do you play the line between being a craft gin distillery but wanting to scale exponentially and become a big player? Yeah, I know that's kind of always the biggest challenge. And it's been interesting <laughs> also looking at the breweries around us, yeah. some of which have scaled exponentially since we've been back. Um, and I think our approach has been quite different to some in that we have taken on, from the very beginning, we've taken on making gin for other people. Yes, yeah. And that's allowed us to scale, yet keep individual brands small. Okay. And the Hope brand in particular, because we're making our own alcohol, it takes us a lot longer. We can never scale it hugely. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sort of having other gins that we're producing, we not only become known as a distillery and not just a brand, yeah. Um, we yeah, are able to kind of keep overheads yeah, you know, kind of, yeah, Absolutely. and um, have other gins, you know, using equipment and downtime and that kind of thing, and that's worked and really well for us. Drink it. Yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> and so we're building the market as well as yeah, being part of the market, which is perfect. great. Yeah, and that um, I guess that leads me to my next question because I, I find it so interesting and, and great that you do support and and distill other brands' gins, but how I guess technically they're your competitors out there in the market, assuming they're all, all craft gins as well. So how do you I guess think of them more strategically than I guess shunning them as competitors. Yeah, I mean I think definitely still at this stage our view is very much let's build the category because that creates interest in the category. Okay. And yes, the craft gin category has grown hugely, but it is still minuscule. Yeah. Um and so, you know, I think it's fantastic that we're helping other gin brands get out there, but they're helping us by growing the category. Growing the demand. Um okay. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been interesting, um, but I don't think of them as my competitors, yeah. you know, um, but I think there is obviously a different dynamic between them because, you know, we have a relationship with all of the brands we make, but yeah. you know, they don't have that same relationship into brand, but hopefully they all do see it as just good for the South African gin Definitely. scene. 
And so, I mean, you have a very distinct brand for Hope on Hopkins. Um, and so how do you, how do you differentiate or where did that come from? Yeah, I know many sleepless nights about whether we were taking the right course of action. Um, so our view and what we're actually going to really start kind of getting the message out next year is we're purists and our brand is very kind of minimal, simple purist. Yeah. Um, and I think as the craft gin market grows and people's interest in gin grows, people will start asking more questions. Yeah. Um, and look for the purist. Yeah. 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 Okay. And that's, yeah. And so you are one of the few that uses barley. Am I getting this right? Yes. Yeah, okay. Barley <laughs> is the base for it. <laughs> we, we use barley for two of our gins, our London Dry and our Salt River. Um, we wanted to use grain just because grain is an incredibly smooth, well, can be if distilled probably, <laughs> an incredibly smooth base spirit. And that's why whiskey is made from grain. Okay. Um, because it, it can just be soft and beautiful. We played around with different grains, yeah. cooking and fermenting them. <laughs> um, and we, they, grain is challenging. Barley is amazing because it's one of the few grains that has enough natural enzymes itself that you don't need anything else. Okay. You can use just barley and the, it's got enough enzymes to convert because what you need is to convert the starches in the barley into sugar. Yeah. Then you can add yeast. The yeast eats the sugar. The byproduct is alcohol. Okay. Um, and so we went for pure barley because... For that reason. For that reason. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, and so, so back to the purest roots. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got to be true to your brand. Okay. Um, and so your, your co-founder is your husband. Um, how... How do you make that work? And I guess, how do you have a separation when you go home at the end of each day, if you do? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Home is literally through that door. Um, <laughs> so keeping work and home separate is, yeah. <laughs> Initially, we were like, we've got to live, breathe the business. And I think especially, you know, starting out, I remember everyone saying to us initially, oh, it takes at least three years to build a business, you know, you've yeah. got to give your heart and soul to it. And so we threw ourselves in completely. We have done a lot of traveling together and we know each other quite well. So we knew it would work working together. Okay. And I also don't think we could have thrown ourselves into it if we'd been married to other people yeah. in quite the same way Actually, that we needed to. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I think we're now getting to the stage where the plan for next year is to try and get a bit of balance, um, spend a little <laughs> bit more time away from the distillery. Famous last week. Yeah, <laughs> perhaps find an escape pad that's not next door to the distillery yeah. to get away to. Um, but it certainly helped as well, you know, because I think hope is also, it's very much about us and, yeah. you know, sort of in growing the brand and sort of brand strategy, we always look back to, well, you know, what would we like, how would, you know, and, yeah. and so that also works. works. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, we do drive each other more <laughs> yeah. times, of course. And my, my boyfriend's probably watching going, well, that doesn't sound at all like that. <laughs> um, and so um, what is your favorite gin drinking tip? I think I would be remiss not to ask. <laughs> okay, well, so people come for tastings here and we do sort of a curated experience once a month. And I sort of always say, if there's one thing you take away from here, and I don't mind how much gin you drink and forget everything else, but my, my biggest tip is don't ruin your gin and tonic with a slice of lemon. Ooh. It's what everyone <laughs> does, and it's easy. If you've got lemon, fantastic, but use the zest, so okay. the rind. That's got all the beautiful lemon citrus oils in it, and it will lift any gin in the world. Okay. But putting a slice in brings bitterness, and, and tonic is quite bitter. Gin is often has hints of bitterness as well from the juniper. What about so, a slice of cucumber? Is that also a no-go? Cucumber depends on the gin. Cucumber is okay. quite a strong flavor, people don't realize. Um, and so it can mask more delicate gins. Okay. Um, I always say, do a little bit of research. It's quite easy. With, there are lots of apps out there. There's an amazing yeah. one called Ginventry. And you literally can look up. They've got, I think, about 6,000 different gins on there, and oh it'll gosh. tell you how the gin distiller suggests you drink their gin. Okay. Perfect. But if you don't have their suggested thing, lemon zest is the perfect thing. Okay. So we're going to write that down for later. <laughs>
Um, and what is next for Hope on Hopkins? I saw you're doing a pop-up at one of the wineries. Yeah, um, yeah we've got a, a, a few things. Um, I think our most exciting thing is that we're doing a little pop-up bar at the waterfront. Oh, amazing. We literally got our license today, so we can now start talking about it. Perfect. And we're doing that with two other gin distillers, which is quite exciting. So it just shows that the industry is collaborative and we all support each other. And that's going to be December, January, February. Perfect, perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, hopefully a few more collaborations in the pipeline for next year. Great. And maybe a few new spirits. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a new still after all. <laughs> okay. Well, you heard it here first. <laughs> um, great. So any last advice for aspiring entrepreneurs or particularly people looking to get into distilling? Um, well, as far as entrepreneurs, I just say follow your passion because you need passion. It's the only way you're <laughs> going to get through the initial initial startup bits. Um, and you know, you also one of the the main things about being an entrepreneur is working for yourself and doing what you love. Yeah. Um, advice for other distillers, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot more admin heavy and cleaning heavy than you could ever imagine. <laughs> But we still enjoy it. And at least you get a drink at the end of the day. That's true. <laughs> Amazing. Well, on that, thank you so much for being on Power Hour. Um, as a massive gin enthusiast myself, I'm very excited to be here and to hear all about it. And now we'll have to pour you a gin and tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I will never say no. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And I will talk to you next week on Power Hour. <laughs>